Amen. Amen. All right, here in Ezekiel chapter number 3, verse number 1, we're going to begin, we're going to preach here through for about 10 verses as the introduction will be the perfect catalyst for the subject of the sermon this morning. I want to look there in Ezekiel chapter number 3, verse number 1, by means of introduction. Again, that's verse number 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, which is often a term that he'll use to refer to Ezekiel all throughout the book of Ezekiel. Son of man, eat that thou findest. And then he says this, eat this roll. Speaking of the Bible, right? And we would refer to that as a scroll, something written down with a pen on a piece of paper. He said, eat this roll. He's talking about eating, eating the Bible, eating God's word. And go speak unto the house of Israel. And I'm going to get more into this in a moment. But notice he says, eat this roll. And after you eat it, after you've eaten it, then go speak unto them, right? Look at verse number two. So I opened my mouth so we can see the obedience of Ezekiel. And he caused me to eat that roll. So he ate the scroll. He ate God's word. Verse three. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Now, this is a very common analogy or figure that is used all throughout the Bible where the man of God, the preacher, or even just a righteous man in general, will eat God's word. And you see this in a vision. It's very interesting. He says that he caused me to eat the roll. So I, I believe this literally happened in a vision. If you literally, figuratively, it happened in a vision, if you know what I mean here. But if you look at verse number three, notice how he describes God's word. He says, then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. God's word is very often referred to as being sweet or as being honey. It's likened unto honey. Psalm 119 verse 103 says, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And God's word is very sweet. Unto the righteous man, but not only is it sweet unto the righteous man, another application of this is notice that it's sweet in his mouth. And that is because God's word has authority, if you will. God's word has power. Even the hypocrite loves to preach God's word. He loves it where? In his mouth. But where is it not? It's not in his heart. His heart is far from him, so he loves it in his mouth. It's sweet in his mouth, saying it's sweet to speak. It's sweet when it, when it rolls off the tongue. God's word's amazing. Even, even like God hating atheists, like Richard Dawkins, I heard one time say that the King James Bible in specific is one of the greatest pieces of literature that's ever been written. Richard Dawkins said that. So even this God hating atheist says, God's word is sweet in my mouth. I like it when I speak those words. They're amazing words. But he doesn't receive the words, he doesn't have them in his heart, right? Look at verse number four. And he said unto me, Son of man, Go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. So notice the purpose of these words is going to go, you're going to go speak or preach to the house of Israel. What's interesting about this is the way that this is worded. He says, and speak with my words unto them. So you're going to speak, <clears throat> but speak with, but speak with my words unto them. Well, this is what every prophet, this is what every preacher, this is what every pastor should do. I shouldn't get up here and preach my philosophies, my concepts, things that I've learned from my experience in life. Let me try to put that into my own words. No, I need to preach with God's word. I need to preach Amen. with the Bible, not just my own words or what I believe or the way that I like to word things. I need to word things the way that the Bible. I need to speak as of the oracles of God, like it says in the New Testament. Look there in verse number five. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, saying it's not a foreign speech or a, or a difficult language that you can't understand. He's, 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 he's sent to Israel. He speaks this language, right? But to the house of Israel. He speaks the language of the Israelites. He speaks Hebrew. Verse six. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou canst not understand. So he explains it. Surely had I sent thee to them, saying someone of foreign language, someone of a foreign nation, someone of a, of a nation that, you know, he, that he does not abide of, anyone other than Israel is his point. He said, had I sent, sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. What's he saying? That Israel is utterly rebellious. Israel is more rebellious than all the nations of the land. All the way, he's saying every nation. I could have sent you anywhere but Israel. And they probably would have hearkened to you. They would have hearkened to you. But Israel, he knows, will not hearken, he says. They're not obedient. They do not receive the word of God. 
Look at verse number 7. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto for they will not hearken unto me. Again, why are they not hearkening unto Ezekiel? Because he's preaching the word of God. Ergo, they are not hearkening unto God. Because those are not Ezekiel's words. They are God's words. So when they are being rebellious, they're not rebelling Ezekiel. When Samuel went to them and he told them, when, it, when they it kept requesting a king and Samuel goes back and tells God what the, the people of Israel, they keep asking for a king. God tells Samuel, don't worry, Samuel. They didn't reject you. They rejected me. So when the man of God stands up and preaches God's word and he preaches things that whether they're offensive or not, and you say, I don't like that, you're not rejecting me, you're rejecting God. Right. If I preach on fornication, if I preach on whatever it may be, hot topics in churches, the independent about the churches that are avoided, like women not wearing pants, they're not rejecting the man of God behind the pulpit. They're not rejecting the preacher or the prophet. They're rejecting God's word is what they're rejecting. Right. What are they not doing? They're not receiving God's word. So they can get all mad and they can try to argue from their standpoint, but they're arguing and debating against God. They're not debating against the preacher. That's not what's going on. They're actually against God. Uh, now notice in verse 7 what he says. So he says in the beginning again, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for, meaning because, they will not hearken unto me. For, because, all the house of Israel, watch this, are imputed and hard-hearted. So saying they're hard-hearted, what are they? They're prideful. That's what he's saying. They're a prideful nation. Verse 8, so because they're prideful, watch this. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant, and that's what adamant means, is strong or hard. As an adamant Harder than flint. Flint is a type of stone, and that is a very, very hard stone. It's a hard rock. Harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So he's telling them already, you're going to go there, and this is a difficult mission. You're going to go there, and I want you to preach a negative message, obviously, unto the house of Israel, and they're not going to listen to you. You're going to go there, and they're not going to receive your words. They're going to reject your words. Before he's even sent, before he even tells them, you know, actually sends him off to go, he's saying, when you get there, they're going to reject your words. So that right there alone takes courage on the part of Ezekiel, but he says, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to make sure that you're strong. Because why? Because there's going to be opposition. And this also is, uh, you know, plays in part today for the preacher, right? Pastors, if they're going to be preaching the whole counsel of God, if they're not going to get up there and just try to tickle people's ears and preach what they know is not going to be disputed, what there's going to be zero controversy about, they don't need to be strong. They don't need to be you know, harder than a flint. They don't need to be you know, adamant. They don't need to stand up here and be prepared like, I don't know how this is going to be taken today. But you know what? That happens a lot in Baptist churches when the pastor is actually preaching the whole Bible. He's probably has, you know, the pastor will have thoughts going through his mind. I don't know how the people are going to take this. I don't know what's going to happen. But you know what he needs to do? He needs to walk behind the pulpit. And he needs to be adamant and harder than a flint. Either way, whether they hear him or not, he needs to preach the word of God. Because it's not his words. He shouldn't be preaching his words in the first place. He should be preaching with the word of the Lord. He should be preaching with God's word. Look at verse number 10. Moreover, he said unto me, now this is key. This is gonna, going to segue us into the topic of what we've really already been talking about. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thy ear. So I want you to notice <clears throat> that these are two different things. And he puts them in re reverse order. The very first thing that you do is what? <coughs> you would hear it with your ears. Then what happens? Then you receive it into your heart. That's what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is receiving God's word. And specifically, receiving, acknowledging God's word, receiving God's word when it's negative. And that's what all of this is about right here. Ezekiel going forth and preaching a negative message, right? But then he's telling him when he goes to preach the negative message, they're not going to receive the words. They're not going to receive God's word. Another point that I want to make quickly right here is notice that he's going to preach God's words and he is going to be, you know, obviously the hope is that they would receive God's word. And there may be a few of them, but by and large, the nation of Israel is going to reject what he preaches, right? But notice that the man of God has to first receive God's word. You have to first 
as the preacher, you have to first as a prophet, you have to first as a pastor. Anyone who's preaching God's word, you should be preaching something that you haven't received yourself. And what do I mean by receive? Not only hear it with your ears, not only understand it with your heart. Receive it in your heart, acknowledge it, and put it into practice, whatever it may be. Actually receive that teaching. Receive it into your heart. Notice that ha that happens first with the Son of Man here. That happens first with the Son of Man. I want you to keep your hand here. I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter number 10. This is very interesting. Like we, we saw there in the beginning with him eating the scroll, right? Well, that eating of the scroll represented the Son of Man hearing God's word and then receiving God's word. And we can see this actually play out a few times in the Bible. <clears throat> so in the beginning of Ezekiel chapter 3, if you look back, you'll notice that first he says, <clears throat> in verse 1, eat this roll. So halfway there through verse 1, he says, eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So first he has to eat it. He has to receive it, right? Then he's got to go preach it. Picturing you have to receive God's word as the preacher first, then go preach it, right? Then he says, Verse 2, so I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels. So notice he's receiving it. Picture of receiving it into his heart. And fill thy bowels with this roll that I may give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as sweetness. So notice how it was in his mouth as sweetness, just like David said that God's word was sweet, and he said it was as honey. Right here it says, as honey for sweetness, in verse 3. Look at Revelation chapter number 10, when, when John... The Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. He says in verse 9, says this, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. So this is a scroll, if you will. This is a roll, like it said. This is the word of God. It's the Bible. He says, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. Does that sound familiar? Take it and eat it up, and it shall be, it shall make thy belly bitter. Now watch this. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Verse 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So see that part repeated about it being in his mouth. It keeps saying it's in my mouth sweet. When I had it in my mouth, it was sweet. When was it sweet? When he swallowed it? No. In his mouth, right? That is the picture of you hearing God's word. That is the picture of you speaking God's word, and it is in your mouth when you are speaking it sweet. But what happened once he swallowed it? It's bitter. It's not always easy to receive God's word. It's not always easy when the man of God stands up and preaches something that is offensive. What is it? bitter. Sometimes it's bitter. It's always, you know, it's easy when you're sitting in the, in, the, in the pews. When you're sitting in the pews and he's preaching on somebody else's sin, right? It's easy. Amen. Amen. Preach on fornication and you're not living in fornication. Amen. Right? But then when he starts hitting on you, it's a totally different story. And a lot of people even talk about, I love hard preaching. I love when he preaches on sin. But do you love it when he preaches on your sin personally? When he preaches on something that, you know, is going to tan your hide, when it's something that's offensive to you, everybody wants to, you know, even if they have their lives cleaned up 95%, no one's perfect. No one is complete, right? But once that 5% starts hitting home, then people's attitudes change all of a sudden. Well, I disagree with them on that. that you no, know, you need to find out whether what he's preaching is Bible first. Right. You, you need to make sure that you're not disagreeing with the Lord. You make sure, like Samuel, that you're not just rejecting the Lord instead of rejecting Samuel, right? right? I want you to notice how he said it was bitter once it was in his stomach. That's him actually receiving God's word. It's, it's hard to actually receive it. He says you're going to go to the house of Israel. They're going to hear you, but they're not going to receive your words. Go back to Ezekiel chapter number 1 and watch this. Or, I'm sorry, 3. Ezekiel chapter number 3. <clears throat> we stopped reading there in verse number 10, I believe. Look at verse number 11. And go, get thee to them, to, get thee to them of the captivity. So notice again, after he heard the words and after he received the words, what does he say? Now that you've eaten it, now that you've received it, now that you're not going to be a hypocrite, you go and preach what I gave you. Now go preach it. Now that you've received the word of God. And then he says, unto, verse 11, unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Look at verse 12. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them. And a noise of a great rushing. Now, what happened to John after he ate it? He ate it, it was in his mouth sweet, and what happened? It was in his stomach what? It was bitter. Look at verse 13, 14. 
So the, the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. So notice it's in his mouth is what? Sweet. Once he receives God's word, he eats it. It's in his mouth. When he speaks it, it's sweet. When he hears it, it's sweet. But once he receives it, it's in his stomach bitter. And that is a picture of most of God's word being negative. 90, you know, really, it's, it, you know, I'd say this, 80%, I bet. I mean, I'm just throwing a number out there, but just from me reading the Bible, how many times I've read the Bible, I would say 80% probably of God's word is negative. If you look at every major prophet, every single one of them, what are they doing? Preaching damnation, preaching God's wrath, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of them. They're all going unto God's nation. They're all going to Israel, and they're just condemning Israel. Stop doing this. Do this. You're wicked. You're rebellious. You're you know, hard-hearted. You're stiff-hearted. You know, you, you, over and over and over again. But look at this. Oh, I want you to flip over to Ezekiel chapter number 2 at the very end. He actually gives him a description of God's word before he eats it. He gives him a, a, a description of what is sweet in his mouth and then what is bitter. Look at verse 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, <clears throat> neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. So he's saying, even when you go there, you're going to be in like the midst of briars and thorns. It's going to be like he's around briars and thorns, but you don't need to be afraid, right? And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Seven, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Verse 8, but thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Now, what is the, that rebellious house not going to do? What are they not going to do? Receive God's word. Now, look at the very next thing that he says. Be not rebellious like that rebellious, rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. So notice, you, I want you to receive God's word first before you go out and preach, but you have to not be rebellious when I give it to you. You have to be obedient to God's word. You have to receive it first. Hear what I say with your ears, but then receive it afterwards. You have to receive God's word. There's a lot of people that will hear with their ears. They'll repeat it and it's sweet in their mouth, but it's not in their heart, right? What did he say to Ezekiel? Hear with your ears and receive it into your heart, right? Uh, Jesus would talk about how, you know, that the Lord is in their mouth, right? But it's, their heart is far from Him. That's a hypocrite. There are many people that sit in the pews, that come to church, sit in the chairs in our example, but they hear God's Word. They'll amen all day long, but they're not putting the things into practice. They'll even agree with you on things where they're not going to do in their own life. They'll agree with you. And then there's the other guy who, you know, he you know, has grown far in his life. He's become very mature in his, in his Christian walk. He's learned much from the Bible and he's implemented into his life. But he's moved so far along, that can cause you sometimes to become prideful. And that other 10% in his life that needs to be fixed, obviously we're never going to come under the perfect man in this life. But we need to never just get to the point where we think we, we don't have any room of growth. Well, we don't think that we can learn anything else. They become stagnant and complacent in their life. And when the man of God preaches something, when a pastor preaches something, if you're listening to something on YouTube and you hear somebody say something that you know that you're doing in your life, you need to not be the rebel like under the rebellious house. You need to not be rebellious. You need to just say, you know what? I need to fix that in my life. I need to not only hear the words that he's preaching, but I need to receive them into my heart. I need to actually start putting this into place. The preacher has to first do that. That's why he says, Don't be like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. So we picked up earlier in, in, in Ezekiel 3.1, but he didn't give us a description of it. The only thing that he said was when he experienced it. When he experienced God's word, it was sweet in his mouth and it was bitter in his stomach. But I want you to watch this. So he says, a roll of a book was therein. Now watch this. And he spread it before me. So he spreads it out. He lays out the roll and like opens it up. And he looks at it. It says, and he spread it before me. And it was written within and without. On one side and on the other side, he's saying. On the back and on the front, look. And it was written therein, lamentations and mourning and woe. Does that sound positive? That sounds pretty bitter, doesn't it? It sounds pretty negative. 
you know, when Ezekiel said to preach something, what is he said to preach? Lamentations and mourning and woe. This is the message that Ezekiel was carrying with him. He's saying, I have something in a roll. It's the book of Ezekiel. It's the Bible. I'm going to give it to you when you eat it. While you're preaching, it's going to be sweet in your mouth. When you swallow it, when you receive it, it's going to be bitter in your stomach. And what is this message? I look at it and you know what it is? It's lamentations and mourning and woe. It's negative. That's the Bible. Lamentations and mourning and woe. The Bible is negative. It is a very, very, very negative book. People want to say, oh, the whole Bible is about the gospel. I agree that the Bible is pointing to the gospel, but there's a lot of other things in there that are not the gospel. And people will try to say that, well, the Bible is just the whole message of love. It's just a love letter. That is not true. Right. That is not true at all. I agree with you that the overall purpose of having this book is pointing to the cross, but there, you know what there is on the way there? A lot of lamentations and mourning and woe. You know what there is? There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of negative to negativity. There's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of bad things that were preached. There were a lot of things that when people heard them, they didn't want to hear them. And what did they have to not be? They had to not be the rebellious house. I want you to look at what's the reason why they didn't receive it. Look at verse number four says, for they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord God. Look at verse 5. Look at in, in the uh, parentheses there. For they are a rebellious house. Look at the end of verse 6. Very end. Though they be a rebellious house. Look at the end of verse 7. For they are most rebellious. <clears throat> Look at verse 8. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. What are they? They're rebellious. And what also did he call them in the very beginning? They're impudent children and they're stiff-hearted. What is it talking about them being stiff-hearted? Talking about someone that's being like, you know, stiff-hearted usually, I think this may be, maybe only like one or two other times is stiff-hearted in the Bible. It's normally, does everyone remember what the other version of this is? Stiff-necked. It's like a person that's just like, they just hate. They're just like sitting up. and then, You know what I mean? That's what I picture. They just like hate what they hear. They're hating what they're hearing. It just kind of makes them mad and they stiff it up. You know what I mean? When you preach to them, they're just like, they're just stiff necked. They're not moving. They don't want to hear it, right? That's just what I picture in my mind. It's talking about a very prideful person. Stiff is like rocky. Their heart is hard, right? They're hard hearted and they're stiff necked. They won't listen to it and they won't hear the preaching. Look over verse 7. Notice how he said impudent and stiff-hearted. stiff, stiff uh, hearted. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> very, very end. He says, for all the house of Israel are impudent, look at this, and hard-hearted. You know what stiff-hearted means or stiff neck means? It means they're hard-hearted. They will not receive the word of God. Now, everybody loves to hear preaching on sin, especially in our church, right? And your churches that we've all been to and are affiliated or know of, definitely not affiliated with, like to hear hard preaching, right? You know, we want to clean our lives up. We need to never get to the point where we feel like my life is already clean. There are things in every person's life, in the, including myself, in this church that they need to get out of their life. Every single person. There are, there are patterns of problems that have existed even from the time you've been saved and you started cleaning your life up now. And you need to not be hard-hearted. You know what? You read those things in the Bible if you read your Bible daily. I preach those things from the pulpit if I'm preaching all of the Bible, right? And you need to not, when those things are preached, be hard-hearted. You need to not be stiff-necked. You need to not be stiff-hearted. You need to receive God's Word into your heart. There are going to be things that I preach that are going to make you mad. There are going to be things that I preach that are going to be like, I don't exactly agree with that. You know what first you need to ask is, am I, not, am I you know, disagreeing with this because it's something he's saying that's not in the Bible, or am I disagreeing with God? Because what did they say with Ezekiel? What were they saying? Do you think that, that they accepted that it was God's word, that what he was preaching? He told them beforehand, they're not disagreeing with you, they're disagreeing with me. So what do you think they're saying to Ezekiel? That's not the word of God. There are pastors that stand up and they preach, which is super clear in the Bible, Men or women should not wear pants. And I bring that up again because it's controversial. And what do a lot of the people say in the, in the pews? What do a lot of people say in the church? That's not right. That's not what the Bible says. They're not disagreeing with that pastor. They're not disagreeing with that preacher. They're disagreeing with God. Right. 
So there are going to be things that I preach, and you need to first make 100% sure, am I disagreeing with you know, Pastor Baker, or am I disagreeing with God? Is this the Lord's words, or are these His words? And we need to never, we need to receive God's word even when it's negative. I want you to turn over to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Two times, Ezekiel, he tells him, God tells Ezekiel, Thus saith the Lord, here at the end of verse 11, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. These things need to be preached whether or not you like it, whether or not you do like it. Whether you like it or you don't like it. You know, he tells him, verse 7 in chapter 2, that was verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 11. Here's Ezekiel 2, verse 7. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. For they are most rebellious. This is not only commanded in the Old Testament, this is commanded in the New Testament. If somebody wants to be a pastor, they need to preach the Word of God no matter if it disagrees with the people. In the, and let, even if you know that somebody has that sin sitting in the congregation, if it's in the Bible, it needs to be preached. You should Amen. not be skipping over something right. just because you don't want to offend somebody. They need to hear it. Amen. They need to know about it. Even if it's a problem that they can't fix in their life now, tell them and they can convince other people not to make that same problem, not to have that same issue in their life. They can help other people, right? Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4. I want you to look at verse number 2. Look at verse number 2. Preach the word. This is Paul, the evangelist, speaking unto Timothy, who's going to be a pastor. He says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Notice verse, chapter 4. Verse 2, very th first three words, those are powerful words. What does he say? Preach the word. Preach the word. Timothy knew what he's talking about. Preach the Bible. Preach God's word. Preach the word. He says, be instant. In season? What does it mean when something's in season? What does it mean when like, you know, like a color or something, whatever it may be, in like women's fashion? You know, I don't even, I can't even give you an example, which is a good thing. Trending. When something's in season, right, it's trending, it's popular, people like it, everybody wants it, right? What does it mean when it's out of, out of season? It's not in season. Nobody wants it, right? That means when you want to hear it, it needs to be preached. And guess what? If you come in here in a grumpy mood and you're like, hey, I don't, I don't feel like hearing that, it needs to be preached. Amen. You need to hear it anyways. Whether you want to hear it or not, whether you like it or you don't, whether it's something that you disagree with or something that I preach that you do agree with, as long as it's God's word, it needs to be heard. You know, it, it's not only also things that are negative. You know, uh, Peter talks about, and so does uh, Paul talks about putting them in remembrance, especially in Philippians chapter number two. I can't three. I can't remember exactly how he words it, <clears throat> but he says to you it, it is grievous. He said, but he knows that it's good that he needs to put them into remembrance. You know what that means is when you keep reminding people of, some, of something, sometimes what would they do? I know, I know, I know. I've heard that before. I know, I've heard you preach about that before. So what, is it, what does that become when you're preaching about something? He says, for you, are you looking at it right now? Oh, okay, I thought you were turning to it. It's like Philippians like 3, like the first couple of verses. But he tells them, for you indeed, it is, uh, does anybody remember? It's like beneficial, basically. It's expedient, maybe. Yeah, he says, you know, but he said, for you, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's grievous to them, but it's expedient. Meaning, it's a, it, he's saying, because he keeps reminding them, it gets annoying. It can become grievous. It can become, you know, just, just, just kind of just like tedious, like over and over and over again. I've heard that before. That means it's what? Out of season. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear that preached anymore. But guess what? If it needs to be preached, it should be preached. If there's a problem in the church, it needs to be brought up repeatedly. If there's a problem going on in the world, especially, we need to be relating these things to the world. If there's a problem out there, you say, I, I'm sick and tired of hearing whatever preached, whatever it may be. Homosexuality is a terrible problem in the United States of America today. They're like, like you know, like people are even saying, some lady in the TED Talk, right, which is a very popular thing, stood up and like promoted pedophilia. She, she said like it's normal. You know, if we look at homosexuals and we say that they can't help what they're doing, which everybody said that's the next step. When you accept that the reason why these bunch of fags are loving each other is because they can't help their feelings, Next is going to be anything anybody says they want. Right. Like pedophilia. And guess what this lady stands up and says? 
you know, they're just born that way. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. We need to just, you know, we need to just allow them to do this. I mean, that's exactly what people are saying. And you're like, why do you, why do just all these churches keep bringing up homosexuality? Why do they keep bringing up pedophilia? Why are they preaching about these things? Because it's expedient for, to keep people safe. That's why. You know, because it needs to be brought up repeatedly, whether it's out of season, whether the world disagrees with it or not. Because it's becoming a problem, that's why. That's why things like that need to be preached on. It doesn't matter whether it becomes annoying to you. It doesn't matter whether it becomes grievous to you. That doesn't matter whether you get sick and tired of hearing about something preached. Whatever it may be, it's expedient. Why? Preach the word, whether it's in season, whether it's out of season. Whether you know, I don't care if somebody disagrees with me about a particular doctrine, about a particular practice. <clears throat> If that's what the Bible teaches, I will preach it as often as I need to preach it. Amen. It doesn't matter if it's a person in this room. It doesn't matter if it's a person that you know, comes into our church and wants to become a member here. It doesn't matter if it's a make or break decision for someone that attends my church now or attends it in the future. If it's the word, I'm going to preach it. Whether Amen. it's in season for you or out of season for you. Whether you like it today and don't like it tomorrow. And everybody who wants to be a pastor needs to have this mindset and say, I'm going to preach the Bible no matter what. I'm going to first eat God's word. I'm going to receive it in my heart. I'm going to make sure I know that that is what the Bible teaches, and I'm sure of that. And then I'm going to make sure that I preach it and I give it unto the congregation so that they can help other people. They can preach the word of God. So this pastor can preach the word of God to them, and they can hear God's word, believe it, put it into their life, right? And then they can better themselves as a Christian. Nobody's made it. Nobody will ever make it. So there's going to be messages that you hear that are going to offend you, everyone. And you need to know right now that God's word needs to be preached anyways, whether you like it or don't like it. And you see here, what did they say at that time? Whether, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, in season, out of season. Preach the word, in season, out of season. What does he tell them to do? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Reprove is negative. Rebuke is negative. Exhort can be negative or positive. You can exhort someone in a negative way. Exhort means to like lift someone up. It's not the exact same as edifying, but it's like it's it's really not to lift up. It's to kind of push, like to get someone in gear. Like exhort them it means like to motivate them, right? But it can be what the words that you're saying when you are exhorting someone can be negative or positive. So notice almost all of this is what just like Ezekiel lamentations and woe and mourning. It's negative. The Bible is that God's word is negative because you're not positive. That's why. You say, why? I can't understand that. It's because God wants you to be positive, but you're not. You know what you, so you know what you need? You need some extra negative charge pumping in there. That's what you need. Because you're not positive. So you need to become positive. And you know the only way you can be positive is if I tell you all the things that you're doing wrong. You understand what I'm saying? And then if you fix those things, then you can become positive. I'm not positive. That's why the Bible is not, you know, the Bible, you know, for, you know it, it's for everyone. Every single person. It doesn't matter whether they're a pastor, right? Man is sinful. That's why you see the nation of Israel taken. And when they're, when, even when they're used, the nation of God, they have the commandments, they have everything that they need. What happens? They fail as a whole, as a nation, right? And people, you know, I've heard people ask this before. Why did the nation of Israel fail? It just feels like they're just like super wicked, right? Well, it's just like the whole world. There's nothing special about them. They're just like, it'd be just like if you selected the random amount of people that were in the nation of Israel, put them into a nation, and God's like, here's my law. What would happen? You think they'd make it? No. They would fail. Everyone understand what I'm saying? Man is not positive. He's negative. That's why you know what you need to hear? You're, you need to be positive, but in order to be positive, you need to be told what you need to do is positive, but you're not positive, therefore it's going to be a negative message. Right? You need to hear negativity to make you positive. You know how a battery works? The negative pumps through and it comes back around to the positive side. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that's how direct current works in DC, right? So you need to be positive, so you need to go through the negative part first. You need negativity to push you around in order to be positive. You have to hear the negativity. If you say, I don't want to hear lamentations in morning and woe, well, well, then you're never going to read your Bible. You say, I don't want to hear lamentations in morning and woe. Well, you need to find a different church. No, I'm just kidding. You're going to hear neg negativity. You need to. 
And all these churches, some of them which are good churches, as far as the people are good people, they're serving God, you know, they love God. If they don't stand up, number one, and they don't preach negativity, they're failing. They are failing their church. They're failing God. Right. If Ezekiel would have went out and he would have preached a positive message, he's a stinking failure. And you know what? I love all these churches, these, these men of God. I love all of these men that are pastors and they're qualified and they should be preaching. Or they, you know, they're preaching parts of the Bible. I love them. But you know what? If they're not preaching God's word in full, they're not preaching the negative parts. They're failing God. Right. They're failing God and they're failing their congregation. And you know what? Their, their congregation's lives are suffering because of that guy behind the pulpit. That if he's too much of a wimp, he needs to get down and let somebody else preach. That's right. If he's too scared to say certain stuff, then get down and let somebody else pastor that church that will preach the negativity. Amen. You know what? And, 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 and that's why it's important, man, to embrace the negativity in the Bible. Because you need to fix your lives. That's right. You know, you need to, I'm nothing special, but be happy that you have a church that preaches the negative parts of the Bible. Because it's rare. It's right. real rare. It's rare, and you know what you need to become a better Christian is you need to hear the negative parts of the Bible. Amen. You need the negativity to make you positive. The power of negative thinking, right? The power of negative thinking. That's true, seriously. This book is meant to help you, and it's negative. Right. This is the book that will change your life. Amen. They have all these books out there. What do they always try to do? Lift you up. Those books don't work. This book works. You know what it does? First, what does Jeremiah do? He's got to go and he's got to break everything down. He's got to, you know, he's got to root up. He's got to tear everything down. It's negative. You, if you want to be positive, you have to first receive the negativity. The lamentations and mourning and woe. When you want to get saved, what do you, what's the very first part? Romans 3.10. Romans 3.23. It's a negative message. You have to first receive the negativity in order to be, be a positive Christian. In order to become in the positive, you have to... Embrace the negativity. What do you have to do? You have to receive God's word. Not only hear it. He says, hear it with your ears and receive it into your heart. You have to receive it into your heart. Now, there are a lot of people that will just hear God's word, but they will not. Go to Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 30. They hear God's word. They like the sound of God's word. They say amen, but they're not actually receiving God's word. God's you know, word is in their lips. It's in their mouth, right? But their heart is far from it. There's a lot of people even in churches that will say, man, you know what? There's a lot of people that Ezekiel went to and preached. They were a rebellious house. They weren't receiving the word of God. But they were still, amen, Ezekiel. They were agreeing with him. Look at Ezekiel 33, 30. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. Notice, in secret is what he's saying. They're, they're doing this in secret. Watch this. And speak one to another. another. Everyone to his brother saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what, what is the word that cometh from the forth of the Lord. Cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. So look, notice, he said, as the people cometh, they sit before thee as my people. What does it mean, as? Like my people. What's the implication? What's it denoting? They're not his people. Do you understand what I'm saying? They sit like they're my people. What does that look like? Like a church? Like people coming in here and sitting? He's like, what are you saying? No, I'm just kidding. Keep looking. <laughs> They, they sit as my people and they hear thy words. Is that the only thing they were told to do? Is that the only thing Ezekiel was told to do? He had to receive it too. Notice, they hear thy words, but they will not do them. Notice, that's the receiving, right? For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetous. Notice, with their mouth they show much love. It's sweet in their mouth, but their heart, what was the other part? Receiving it into their heart. He said their heart goes after covetousness. They like to speak it. They like to say it. They like to agree with you. They look like church members. They look like Christians. They look like, hey, they might even be saved. They might even be God's people, but their heart is far from it, right? Their heart is going after covetousness. They didn't receive it into their heart, did they? Where was it only? In their mouth. Notice how he says it exactly. For with their mouth they show much love. It's in their mouth, but is it in their heart? Notice that distinction there, what it's trying to tell you. But their heart goeth after covetousness. Look at verse 32. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice. So do they like to hear it? They do, don't they? It's sweet in their mouth. They like to hear it in their ears. It's sweet to them. Song of one that hath a pleasant voice. Remember what I talked about? How it tickles their ears, right? In 2 Timothy 4. 
No, we didn't actually read that part. But that's what it said later on in those verses that we, that we skipped that I didn't mean to. Look at verse 32. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. People like listening to music, right? They like to hear instruments playing. It sounds good to their ears. They're saying they enjoy hearing it. It's pleasant to their ears. They like to speak it. For they hear thy words. They hear them, but look. But they do, but they do them not. Verse 33, and when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Knowing that this was not only his words, they like to hear your words, but they don't really understand it's the word of God. They like to hear them, but they don't actually do them. And then once it comes to pass, they're going to realize, I should have actually received these words. I should have actually put them into my heart. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 42, verse 4. Jeremiah chapter number 42, verse 4. Preachers are commanded to preach the word. What was Ezekiel supposed to do? He said, go speak with my word, right? You remember when Jonah was sent? What was, what was the, the only thing really that was told Jonah before he went? It's interesting the way that it's wording. He, he tells him, go preach unto Nineveh the preaching that I bid thee. Notice how he said that. Go preach unto, unto Nineveh the preaching that I bid thee. Saying what I tell you to preach. Go preach what I tell you to preach. What's he already telling him? Don't go preach what you're not going to be going and preaching what you want to preach. You're going to be going and preaching the preaching that I bid thee. So when you get there, don't preach your own words. Preach the preaching that I bid thee, right? Look at Jeremiah chapter number 42, verse 4. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing, the Lord shall answer you. So he's going to go to them. They told him, hey, you know, inquire for us to God. You know, beseech God for us. Pray on our behalf. Intercede for us. And he said, okay, I'm going to go and pray for you. But when, the, when God returns answer, he says, it shall come to pass that whatsoever, the, whatsoever thing, the Lord shall answer you. I will declare it unto you. And then he says this, I will keep nothing back from, the, from you. Go to Acts 20.20. 20, 20. Acts 20.20. 20. So we see Jeremiah saying, I'm going to preach God's word. I'm going to preach all of it. I'm not going to keep anything back. Right? <clears throat> Go to Acts chapter 20, verse 20. We see Paul saying the same thing. <clears throat> he said in verse 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Notice he said, Jeremiah, what I want to point out about this is Jeremiah said, I'm not going to keep anything back from you. Then notice when Paul says, I didn't keep anything back from you. What are the things that he specifically that he didn't keep back? Notice what it says. But I have showed you and have taught you publicly. Oh, I'm sorry, right before that. I've, I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. If someone, I want you to focus on this point right here. If, if a preacher was to keep something back from his congregation, is it going to be the positive or the negative? Think about this. The negative. What is going to be profitable? The positive or the negative? The negative. Notice what he says. I didn't keep back anything profitable from you. Notice Jeremiah when he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask the Lord. I'm going to beseech God on your behalf. I'm going to intercede for you. And I'm going to pray to him, whatever answer he gives me, whatever he tells me to tell you, I'm going to tell you all of it. I'm going to, keep, I'm going to give you all of it. I'm not going to keep back anything. But if Jeremiah was to become scared and was to become discouraged or dismayed and didn't go pre preach part of the message, what part do you think it was? It would be the negative part. And you know what part that is? You know what part that all these pastors are omitting from their sermons? It's the negative part. But do you know what else? It's the exact part that's profitable for them. Yeah. And you know what? You as the congregation, you as the hearer and the listener of God's word, do you know what part most of the time is going to be profitable for you? Something that hurts your feelings. Yeah. Something that's hard for you to hear. Something that can change your life and be profitable for you. That's what it's going to be. The profitable part, the part that's going to help you is going to be the part when you become stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Most of the time it is. But what did he tell him? Don't be, what did he tell him? He don't be rebellious like this rebellious house. Don't be hard-hearted like them. So you need to make the decision. Are you going to be like Ezekiel? Are you going to put the word of God in your mouth and like it in your mouth and speak it? And it's sweet into your tongue, right? But you need to also receive it. And it's bitter sometimes. And sometimes it can be hard, right? It can be bitter. You like, you know, the sugar that's sweet. But then you also like salt's not bitter. You like grapefruit. 
Right? That's bitter. Right? You need to like both. You need to like the sweet part. You need to like the honey. You need to like to speak it. You need to like the positivity of God's word. Two different layers of application there, right? But then you need to also like the bitter part. You need to also like the negativity. You need to also like and enjoy. Why? Because it's profitable. Right. Put it in your mind. When I hear something that, you know, that, that just burns me up, when I hear something that's negative, obviously don't just receive it without trying it, check it, and make sure it's the Bible when I preach it. But a lot of times if it bothers you, it's probably profitable. It's probably going to help you. It's probably going to help you grow in your Christian life. It's probably an area where you're lacking. And don't, the first thing should be, that's not God's word. Just because it bothers you, it's not God's word. Just because it's grievous. Just because, you know, you know, it feels like I'm attacking you personally, whatever it may be. You need to look it in the Bible with an honest, open heart, a soft heart. It reminds me of this, uh, the, the, the stiff-hearted, the hard-hearted idea. The parable of the, the sower. What is that whole parable about? What is he sowing? The word. the word of God. I believe all of those people received the word, but who? The what ground was it? Stony. Stony ground. What is that? It's like the hard heart, isn't it? It's the same way of getting saved. Because you have to receive God's word. You have to. It said right there, he said, when, he, when uh, Ezekiel was preaching to them in Ezekiel 33, he said that they, that they hear it. But then they don't do it. You do have to do something to be saved. You have to. There is an act. It's just not a work. You have to believe, right? You have to actually hear it. And what is it? It's negative. Why do most people not get saved? What's the majority of people that don't get saved? They don't want to hear the Bible because of pride. They don't want to hear the Bible because when you start talking about I'm a sinner and all this. When somebody who seems to be interested, where they just they want to hear God's word, but then you just can't get them saved. What's the reason? Most of the time, almost all of the time. It's because of pride. So often, it's never, is it really because people don't understand? How often do you just have someone who just can't understand? That's not real often, is it? I mean, sometimes maybe a child or something. But if you really get hung up on someone that feels like this person really seems to be very interested, but they just won't, they won't receive God's word. Why? Because they're stiff-hearted. Because they're hard-hearted. Because they have, it's, you know, they have a stony heart. And when you sow the word of God, it just lays on the top of their heart because they don't receive it into their heart. And then the devil comes by and swoops it up and takes it away. Over and over and over again, there's one reason why you won't be able to receive profitable preaching. One reason. Because it's, it's, it's a lot of the things that people are keeping back from their church because it's a negative message. Because it's a lot of times it's lamentations and mourning and woe. That's most of the Bible, my friend. You need to get used to negativity. You know, negativity, you know, <clears throat> what I said earlier, I wasn't kidding. You know, there is power in negative thinking. If you want to fix something in your life, you have to have, you have to, it starts with negativity. It really does. You know what you have to do? You have to realize you're wrong. You have to realize you're not good. How do you get saved? Realize I'm a sinner. I'm not good and I need a savior. I'm, I can't do it and I need someone else to do it for me. Do you know how you're going to get better at doing anything? How you're going to learn something? You have to first realize I don't know how to do this. The people that come, and if, you, if you've ever trained someone, or if you've ever, you know, if you've ever been a supervisor, or whatever it may be, a foreman or something, you know the, the hardest people, the people that never learn, and never grow, you can spot them from the beginning, and they know everything right when they get there. They, you know why? Because they, they can't think negatively. They can't receive anything negative. They won't receive the negativity. You have to be humble. You have to understand. There's going to be things you don't know how to do. There are tons of things you don't know how to do. There's going to be things in the Bible you're not doing. There are things in the Bible that you don't have right today. That you've never had right and you need to get them right. But guess what? You've got to be humble to do that. You have to be humble. You're going to hear. One morning may just seem like every other morning. You come in, you sit in your pew, and then I'm going to preach on something that just makes you mad. You know what you need to do? You need to look at what I'm preaching. And if it's God's word, you need to get it right in your life. Amen. There's going to be a morning or a night that's just like every night. You know, I'm your guy's friend, but, you know, there's going to be a night where I come up here and I'm going to feel like your enemy. Am I, be am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You know, I'm going to preach a message that's going to be very offensive to you. That's going to happen. If you sit, if I sat in there with it, under any pastor, he would, whoever it is, if he's preaching the whole counsel of God, there's going to be a message that will bother me eventually. You know why? If he's preaching the whole counsel of God, if he's keeping back nothing... And you know what? Those, that would be the most profitable message for me, probably. Right. Maybe not, but most of the time, it would be. 
It would be. Most of the time, that would be the message that would be most profitable for me. And you know what? It's not only the baby Christian that has a lot of room to grow that can sometimes be hard-hearted. Sometimes it can be the Christian that's been a Christian for a long time. Sometimes it can be the guy that's done a lot because they get to a point where they feel like they look around and they start doing what the Bible tells you not to do, measuring yourselves among yourselves. And you're like, man, I am a good Christian. They may not say those exact words in their, in their own mind, but they start to think that way. You know what that causes them to do? Become stiff-hearted, hard-hearted, and then they don't grow. And then when that message is preached, they can't receive it into their hearts. They like it. They'll talk about it. They'll speak it. It's sweet in their lips. They'll bring it up, and they look like... As my people, they look like they agree. They may even say amen, but they're not receiving it into their heart. They're not actually making these changes, right? I want you to turn, I'm going to have you turn to just a couple more verses here. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 36. We'll see an example of good and bad. Jeremiah chapter number 36. I'm going to turn to these real quick. I don't have them pasted, but I want to read a couple of verses to you real quick. Just about, just random verses just about receiving God's word. Job chapter number 22 is the first one. Job chapter number 22, and this is verse 22. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. So notice, receiving the law, receiving the word. What part of God's word is the hardest to receive for most people? The law, the commandments. It's getting this right. Don't do this and do this. Most of it's negative. Don't do this and do this. And notice when he receives it, where does it go? In his heart. It goes in his heart. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter number 2. Actually, you don't need to turn there. Stay where you're at. Sorry. Proverbs chapter number 2, verse number 1. Proverbs chapter number 2, verse number 1. I'm going to read to you real quick. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Again, what part of the word is it? It's commandments. If thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. When the Bible talks about hiding something, where does it normally hit? In your heart. So notice again, where's the word going? In your heart. You did, when you receive it, it's always talking about it going into your heart. You're actually taking it in. You're not only speaking, you're not only being a hypocrite, you're actually doing it. You are really, truly receiving it, acknowledging it, understanding it, right? Where did I have you turn one more time? Jeremiah 36? All right, Jeremiah chapter number 36. It's interesting because when God comes to Ezekiel, it looks very similar to when God comes to uh, Jeremiah. If you ever notice, when he comes to Ezekiel and he gives him, he says when he gives him the roll, he says the roll is in his hand. In Ezekiel, right? When well, you know what comes to Jeremiah? He says, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. You know what comes to him? He says a hand comes to him. He doesn't say what's in it, but I bet there was a roll in it. It would just make perfect sense. When he comes to John, what does he have? Right? You have to eat God's word. You have to receive it. Notice before he sent Jeremiah out, what did he have to do? Receive God's word. And what was Jeremiah going to do? Was it positive or negative? Jeremiah got in, was in, was later on, consequently, because of preaching God's word, was put in the stocks. He was arrested and put in the stocks. You know where else he went? In mire, right? Prison and then ultimately in the mire, in the dungeon, right? Why? Because what he was saying was positive. It was negative. If they would have listened, would it have been profitable? It would have been, wouldn't it? They would have saved a lot of what? Lamentations and mourning and woe. A lot of bad things would have been saved to them and it would have been profitable. What do you think they, you know, if of all the sermons that they heard preached, which sermon from Jeremiah, which sermons from Jeremiah do you think, you know, they disliked the most? Is it coincidence that it was probably the most negative sermon about them? Yeah. Right? And you know what? That would have been the most profitable to them. This is what I want you to think in your mind the next time you hear something that I say or another preacher says or another pastor says. When you hear something and you realize, like, I'm offended. How dare you? You know what you need to think right away? You know what? This might be the most profitable message for me. That needs to be the next, next thought that follows. I can't believe he just said that. But I've never heard that before. When you start to, when that feeling arises of, like, you know, being offended or bothered or uncomfortable, right? You start shifting in your chair or whatever you're doing. You try to have the thought follow, this could help me. This could be something I could change my life that would help me drastically. Major. This could be profitable in my life. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 9. We're going to read a portion of scripture here. I want you to notice the difference between it's a good example and a bad example. It's almost like what I just mentioned a moment ago, how he sows the seed. Some people receive it, some people don't. The difference was pride and then humility. Jeremiah 36, look at verse number 9. 
And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of jo Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem, and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. Then read Barak in the, in the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. So they're hearing it, they hear it in their ears, right? When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, had heard out of the book of a book all the words of the Lord. So these are not Jeremiah's words. These are not Barak, Barak's words. These are the Lord's words. Then he went down into the king's house into the scribe's chamber, and lo, all the princes sat there, even Elishama, the scribe, and Eliah, the son of Shemaiah, and Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, Hananiah, and all the princes. Then Micaiah... Uh, declared unto them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the book in the ears of all the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shilamiah, the son of Cushai, unto Barak, saying, Take in thine hand the roll, wherein thou hast read in the ears of all the people. Right? The roll that was given to Ezekiel. Take in thine hand the roll, wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. Notice how it keeps saying, Read it in our ears, read it in our ears. They can hear it, right? So Barak read it in their ears. Now it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and another, and said unto Barak, We will surely tell the king of all these words. What does it take in order to be afraid? It takes humility, doesn't it? It takes a humble heart. Is this a hard heart? No, they're actually receiving these words. They're believing these words. They're like, we need to do something about this. Why? Notice they start to take action. They're like, we need to go tell the king. We need to do something about this, right? Look, <clears throat> verse number 17. And they, and they asked Barak, saying, tell us now, how didst thou write all these words in his mouth? Then Barak answered them, he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Barak, Go hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. And they went into the king and into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elisha, the scribe's chamber, and Jehudai read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. So the words are being read in his ears. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, it says, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Now what is implied when it says in verse 23, and it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves. What is implied? Has it all been read? It hasn't. What did he, he didn't even want to hear it anymore, did he? You know what you have people doing all throughout the Bible when the, when the word of God is being preached? They'll stop their ears, it says. They don't even want to hear it in their ears. Why don't they want to hear it with their ears? Because they don't want to receive it into their heart. You notice the first time it keeps bringing up, we heard it with our ears, we heard it with our ears, we heard it with our ears. It says it like four or five times. And what do the people do? They humble themselves. It was a negative message, and they weren't stiff-hearted, they weren't hard-hearted, right? They weren't stiff-necked. They received it into their heart. But then they go unto the king, which how often is it that there's a humble king? Just from the Bible, not often. So what's probably going to be his issue? He's going to be proud. He's going to be stiff hard. He's going to be hard hard. It's going to be, you know, he's going to be a proud man. He's not humble. And they, they start reading it to him and preaching it to him. And he's like, bring me that. Doesn't even want to hear it. I don't know how much he read, but it wasn't all of it. That's the implication. That's clearly denoted. And it says they read three or four leaves, and he's like, bring it to me. And he cuts it up. Why? Can't even stand to hear it. He doesn't even want to hear it. You know what it did? It bothered him. Just, exact, there's no difference, my friend. When you're sitting in the church, you're sitting, and something starts to bother you, it's exactly the same as this situation. Something starts to annoy you. Do you think, you know... In one sense, wouldn't you agree that when you're being annoyed and you're being bothered by something or something makes you uncomfortable, isn't there a part of you that doesn't want to hear it anymore? Just like him? Isn't there a part of you that just wants that to go away? Just stop it. Just forgot. God forbid, don't just get a penknife and cut the Bible up, though. Just don't do that, right? But 
we, there's part of you that just doesn't want to hear it, don't, doesn't it? Isn't there? There's part of you that just wants to just stop your ears, right? Obviously, we wouldn't go that far. But do you see the commonality there? Between how we feel, there's no difference. Why? Because it was negative. Would this have helped him if he would have had the same attitude as them? His problem is pride, like it always is, when people don't receive God's word. He wanted to make sure he didn't receive it into his heart, therefore he didn't even want to hear it with his ears. And would this have been, you know, would this would have been unprofitable or profitable for him? Notice a pattern. Every time somebody preaches something, every time some, there's a part that's negative, it's the most profitable for that person. That's why it's the power of negative preaching. The power of negativity. The negativity is what helps you. The negativity is what will help you get your life right. The negativity is what's profitable for you. The negativity is positive. Eventually, right? Just like in a DC battery, it will become positive. But you know what you have to do? You have to receive it. You can't cut it up with a pen knife. You can't just blow it off. You have to receive it in your heart. You can't be as my people. You can't just sit there, amen, and agree with it. You can't just you know, sit there and get, you know, not just not want to talk about it afterwards, just blow it off and try to forget about it. Just like, you know, it was laid upon the stony ground, the sower sowed the seed and laid on the sower ground. It's not going to be there anymore. If you, if you just ignore it today, well, just, you're just going to forget about it someday. That's what, you, that's what a lot of people want to do. That's what he wanted to do. He just wanted to get rid of it. Cut it up, throw it in the fire, and get it out of here. That's why they wanted to stop their ears. When Stephen was preaching, they stopped their ears. I don't want to hear this. Why? Would that have been profitable for them? Yeah, they could have got saved. What? But guess what? It was negative. You killed the Lord. You've rejected. The one and only true God came, and you've already rejected the Messiah. They stopped their ears. It's just like they cut it with a pen knife. But that was the most profitable message that they could have heard. The power of negative preaching. All throughout the Bible, God doesn't want them to go there and condemn the nation of Israel. He wants them to get right. The fact that he's sending a prophet is for their benefit. Right. It's to help them. It's not for Ezekiel. God loved them. So when you hear you know, negative preaching, when you hear something that hurts your feelings, is it in the Bible because God just likes to just like hurting your feelings? And he sits up there and laugh, ha, ha, laughs at you. No. He loves you and he wants you to get it right. Right. The, you know, a pastor that's willing to stand by the pulpit and preach the whole thing, he's nervous when he walks up behind the pulpit. He, had, you know, he has to build himself up just like God tried to lift up Ezekiel and say, hey, be strong. Don't be dismayed. Why? Because it's hard to do that. They're not doing it because they enjoy hurting your feelings or offending you and they just get a rise out of it. Why do they do it? Because it's profitable for you. Because it's meant to help you. And if it's negative, what should you think? This could probably help me. Let me look at this. Not being biased. Let me be neutral in this and study it out in the scriptures. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to receive it into my heart. I'm going to actually start doing it. Right? I'm not only going to hear it with my ears. Amen. James chapter number 1. Let's go to James chapter number 1. This will be the end here. James chapter number 1, verse number 21. James chapter number 1, verse number 21. I'm going to read to you too from Ezekiel. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter number 20. This is what people often do. This is a little nugget. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. But when people hear something that they don't like, sometimes they'll just reject it. I don't believe that. But you know, oftentimes what you know, another group of people will do, they won't just reject it while they say, well, I don't think that means that. I don't think it means that. I think it means this, right? Well, you know, it says, you know, that, a, that a, uh, it talks about pertaining. You should not put on that with pertaineth to a man. So that doesn't, like, actually mean they can't wear pants, Right? People just try to change it. Let's say that's not literal. That's figurative. Well, they said the exact same thing. The nation of Israel said the exact same thing to Ezekiel. You know what he came with? Lamentations and mourning and woe. He came with a negative message. And they were like, what he's saying is not literal. Listen to this. Uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 45. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward the south and drop thy word toward the south and prophesy against the forest of the south of the field. So is that positive or negative? It's against, right? It's negative. Against the forest of the south field. And say to the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in thee. And it shall devour every green tree in thee and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched. And all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. Notice, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. This is very negative, isn't it? There are lamentations and mourning and woe. Listen. And all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Now look at their response. 
Then said I, Ah, Lord God, they saved me. So when he's preaching, they saved me. Does he not speak parables? Why did they say that? Because they didn't like it. Did they want it to be literal? No. They're like, he's just preaching in parables. God's like, I'm going to burn up every city. I'm going to burn up all the faces. I mean, that's pretty graphic. I'm going to burn up the faces from the north to the south and every tree. And they're like, it's just parables. And they enjoy hearing it. They're like pleasant voices. He's just speaking parables. Why? Why do they say that? When it, you know, of course, when it comes to something negative, they want a different interpretation. It's just pertaineth to a man. It's not really, you know, it doesn't really mean like, like, like man's clothes. It's just like what pertains to See what people do? This is exactly what they always do with things. They, they either just don't want to hear it. They either just shut their ears, shut their heart, reject God's word outright, or they'll debate with you and argue with you about it and try to make it say something that it doesn't say. Try to say, oh, it's not little. It doesn't really mean what it says to me. It doesn't really mean like he's like really going to burn the trees. When he says he's going to burn the trees, it doesn't really mean he's going to burn the trees. When he says he's going to burn the faces, he's not literally going to burn the faces. Right? No, it's literal. That's what people do. Obviously, there are figurative things in the Bible, but... It's, uh, let me say this. What's figured and what's literal? People say that. And they'll try to argue. It's like, you know when it's figurative and you know when it's literal. You don't need me to explain it to you. It's obvious. When it's figurative, it's figurative. When it's literal, it's literal. Take it literal unless you have to take it figurative. That's a rule that you can use. I've heard many, many people say that my pastor always said when I was learning the Bible. But listen, it's, it's obvious. If, you know, it's very, if you're asking, you know, is this figurative? It's figurative, I'm sure. The more you study your Bible, the more clear it becomes like this is figurative. This is not literal, or this is literal and not figurative. Look at James chapter 1, verse number 21. I've been harping on this repeatedly. It's because of how important this is to receive God's word. The one ingredient which is humility, which is meekness. Look at James chapter number 1, look at verse number 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and, su and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Notice that. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness. What, is, what does it mean to be meek? It means to be humble. What do you need to receive the word? Notice every time it says receive the word. What do you need? You need humility. You have to have a humble heart. You cannot have a hard heart. You cannot have a stiff heart. You cannot have a stiff neck. No one has made it, including myself, including everyone, every pastor. No one has. We will never arrive under that perfect man. Paul wanted to make it. And, and, and would you say that you're kind of on par with Paul as a Christian? Not even close. And he said he's not going to make it. No one's going to make it. Nobody. So get it in your mind you have problems and they're going to be preached on. Get it in your mind that when you hear that, this, this could be a profitable message for me. Is that what's important to you as you're growing as a Christian? That should be what is our main goal. Going under that perfect man, right? Moving on under that perfect man that we may, you know, the stature and measure of Christ. That's what we want to do is be like Christ. He's perfect in all ways, right? That's who we want to be like. And, we need, and we're always going to grow. We're never going to be like Christ. We're never going to make it unto what he is. We're never going to be perfect. That means, that means you know what you got? You got a lot of negative things in your life. You got a lot of problems in your life. You need to point it out. And when they're pointed out, don't harden up. Don't get a stiff heart. Don't cut it with a pen knife figuratively. Don't stop your ears. Don't just get mad. If you're getting mad, try to train your mind that to, re to remember this and say, that, that could be profitable. That could be something that helps me. Maybe I'm just getting mad because it bothers me, and I know that that's right. I know what God's Word is saying. Don't try to change the interpretation of it. Ah, oh, he speaks in parables. Tell somebody after the sermon. Ah, oh, he speaks in parables. Believe God's Word. Believe it, and, and what do you do? You eat it, make it sweet in your mouth. I love to speak God's Word. I love God's Word. I love God's Word. I love to talk about God's Word. I love to fellowship about God's Word. But don't only just love to talk about it. You know, it needs to be in your heart, too. It needs to be truly you've received it. You need to receive it in your heart. You need to love God's word in your mouth. And speaking it, 
but you need to also love to receive it and to put it into practice and actually receive God's word in sincerity and in truth. And what is the one ingredient that you need? What is the problem? So many people missed out on blessings in their life. So many people ruined their lives. The nation of Israel repeatedly is just like this series of disaster, this series of catastrophe upon their nation and upon their land because they lack one thing. That is, what I just said seems very simple, but that is a fact. Would anybody disagree with that? Every problem that arose upon the nation of Israel, every time they went down the wrong path, God sent a prophet to them. They always had a chance to, to turn around. And what's the one reason why they didn't? They were proud. They weren't humble at heart. That is the main ingredient in receiving God's word. That is it. You have to receive God's word. You have to believe it by faith. You have to put it into practice, right? So let's always be humble. Never feel like, oh, I've made it. Oh, I've, you know... You know, we look around at these other fundamental Baptist churches. They have so many problems. Yeah, they might have more than you, but you have a lot too. Really. You have issues too in your life. You have a lot of problems in your life. We got all these things right, these other Baptist churches. Yeah, you got a lot of issues too, buddy. You do. And when you start to get that attitude, you start to get this pride, like the new IFB. They are so stinking full of pride. It's ridiculous. And what are they constantly doing? All the time. We're the only ones going soul winning. Look how great we are. We're awesome. There's nobody like us. I think we are the last bastion of Christianity, real Christianity upon this earth. Look, listen to those words. It's such pride. It's disgusting. It's like oozing out of every hole that they have. And they keep comparing, measuring themselves among themselves. They're not wise. You know, and you know what? They're just prepping themselves. All the preaching that's going to come across the pulpit, even if the, if, if the pastor's preaching it, but if he is, all the preaching that's going to come across the pulpit, they're going to hear, right? But they're not going to receive it in their heart. They're going to sit in the, in the pew, amen. Yeah, I agree with that. They're not putting that in practice. They're, that, is, that is a fact. That's what happens. Do you know what stops you from growing as a Christian? You know what, you, the, what keeps you growing is humility. And when the humility... Uh, leaves, you're not going to grow at all anymore. It's not possible to grow as a Christian without humility. It's not possible. Because the reason why you're not growing is be obviously because there's problems, right? Well, you know, you have to, in order to, to uh, you know, fix the problems, you have to first acknowledge that there is a problem. And what do you need in order to acknowledge it in the first place? Humility. Meekness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word. That is able to save your souls. The same, the same word that has the power to save your soul. Think about that. The same word of God that has the power to save you from hellfire is able to help you in your life. It's the same word of God with that power. It's able to save you in this life physically. It's able to save you from, you know, from death physically and death to save your soul from hell. So we need to receive the words. Not only sweet in our mouth, but it needs to be bitter in our stomach. You need to receive the bitter. You need to embrace the negativity, right? Amen. You need to. It's good for you. It's profitable for you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we love you, dear Lord. We love you so much that you not only tell us, you know, that you love us in the word of God, but you, you tell us the state that we are in, that we're, that we're negative, that we're sinful, that, you know, we have sins, that we need to fix them, that we're, you know... And you speak strongly against us that we're wicked in some ways and, and some things that we do are evil, dear Lord. Just we ask you that, that you would help us to stay, help us to stay humble, dear Lord. Help us to continue to grow. Help us not to become prideful, dear Lord, and think that we've arrived, dear God. Just be with us and help us all to be humble, dear Lord God, and, and, and to stay humble to the end of our lives and to love your word not only in our mouth but to receive it into our heart. And to actually want to do it. Help us not to be a hypocrite here. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.